A few more big sponsor departures and the cruel spectacle known as the Iditarod could be on its last legs. Draining the Iditarod, sparing the dogs, next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, PETA is urging the cancellation of the 2021 COVID-era Iditarod as the race begins this first weekend in March and goes for two weeks in Alaska. Dogs urged on by their mushers to go a thousand miles in sub-zero temperatures. To their deaths? Last year, 220 dogs were pulled off the race due to injury or exhaustion. What will happen during COVID? Here's my conversation with anthrozoologist John D. Leonardo, PETA Senior Manager of Animals and Entertainment and National Grassroots Campaigner, specializing in the Iditarod, on the PETA Podcast. This year, COVID, it's hurt the race, right? I mean, they've, they had to reroute the race. Yeah, they're doing a, an 860-mile loop, uh, starting and ending in Willow. But, I mean, 860 miles is still an extremely large amount of space for, for a dog to, to be forced to pull heavy sleds and heavy mushers across icy terrain. Um, so this, this race is, is not going to be any safer for the dogs. And honestly, it, it, it may even be much more dangerous, um, given that, that dogs and mushers may actually contract COVID. So PETA is actually calling on Iditarod CEO Rob Urbach to cancel the 2021 race um, because not only do dogs die on and off the trail every year, but many of them do develop respiratory infections um, and respiratory diseases when they're forced to run. The leading cause of death, actually, in, uh, for dogs who run the Iditarod, is aspiration pneumonia, which is caused by them them uh, inhaling their own vomit from being forced to run so very hard. Pete has estimated that 81% of dogs who finish a race will end up with lung damage under normal conditions. So it could be worse under these COVID conditions, huh? I mean, these, these dogs, they can't socially distance. And those who finish the race, you know, do suffer from long-lasting, sometimes permanent damage to their lungs. Um, so add, you know, add up a, a deadly disease on top of that, and that could be dire. When they talk about dogs dying uh, from the race, what has the record been for, uh, you know, mortality, and how worse can it get now? Oh, more than 150 dogs um, have died in the history of the race. And back in 2017, there were, were five dogs who died just in that race, including one who, um, who died from aspiration pneumonia. We also had one die from that in 2018 and in 2019. Um, so it's, it's, uh, so, I mean, the, the, the threat of, of illness and death is, is very high on a normal year. So if we add, you know, coronavirus to that, um, I mean, it's, 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 it, it, it is very unwise for them to persist. I mean, it's unwise for them to persist with the Iditarod in, in any normal year, I mean, given the, the high rate of death and injury. And last year, there were more than 220 dogs who were actually pulled off of the race um, because they couldn't go on anymore they, due to exhaustion, illness, or injury. Yeah, well, how can a veterinarian or veterinarians, I imagine there's more than one, who are you're supposedly caring for these dogs, part of the race, how could they allow this race to go on? A medical park family who is, you know, uh, one of the sponsors of the Iditarod, I mean, they, they pulled out of the race this year. So, I mean, there, there's, there's people in the medical field who, who, who are, you know, in agreement with us, many, many veterinarians. I think every responsible veterinarian out there would agree that, you know, there's no such thing as a sled dog. I mean, they're just like any dog who, who would curl up on our couch or live inside our homes. But these dogs are being forced to run beyond their breaking point. And when, uh, when they're not being forced to race, 
They're being chained up to dilapidated houses or plastic barrels in freezing temperatures. There's many dogs who don't even make it to the race. And when we talk about more than 150 dogs being killed for the Iditarod, we're only talking about those who died, you know, during the race. We're not talking about the ones, you know, the countless dogs who were killed simply because they weren't fast enough or froze to death on, uh, you know, on the end of a chain or just, you know, we're, we're pushed too far in practice and, and may have been dragged to death. It doesn't seem like for as valued and as prized as these dogs are, it doesn't seem like they, the, the, the mushers, the people who are the humans who are supposedly caring for these dogs, do a lot of care. It seems like they're very cruel to these dogs. Oh, yeah. I mean, a- absolutely. But we've done investigations into, um, into the kennels of, of championship mushers. We've been to Mitch Seavey's kennel. We've been to John Baker's kennel. These are, are people who are considered Iditarod royalty. But when a PETA investigator worked at, you know, two dog kennels owned by these former champions, and they found widespread cruelty and, and animal suffering. There were dogs who were denied veterinary care for painful injuries, kept constantly chained next to dilapidated boxes and plastic barrels in the bitter cold and biting wind. And they were forced to run even when they were exhausted and dehydrated. So these mushers, the people who are the humans who are involved in this sport, they're not heroes, right? I mean, they're seen as champions. And for those who glorify this race, they see them as heroes. But are they heroes at all? Uh, no, I mean, these, the, the heroes are the activists who are on the front lines trying to stop this race, who are protesting, you know, sponsors like Millennium Hotels and Resorts, which is still pumping money into this cruel race. I mean, this year we got Exxon Mobil to, uh, to drop their, their sponsorship of the race, and they were the 10th major sponsor to cut ties with the Iditarod after hearing from PETA and her supporters, yeah. um, sending the message that this race needs to end right now. Exxon Mobil is, it follows the lead of Alaska Airlines, Chrysler, and uh, Jack Daniels, Coca-Cola, and countless sponsors who who have decided that they no longer want to associate their brand with animal cruelty. Well, tell me, uh, in terms of the sponsorship, um, what what kind of money are we talking about that that backs the race? Millions of dollars? Um, what, what, what would you, what's the estimate? Yeah, Exxon Mobil was pumping uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars into the race every year um, in recent years. So I mean, there's there's big money in this race, but do but that money is coming from sponsorships. Yeah. So the more sponsors that we get to drop, you know, the the quicker we're going to end this death race. Well, the trend seems to be that more and more are joining. You mentioned Exxon Mobil uh, to added to this long list. Why do you suppose it's going up? Is it because of the pressure of uh, PETA and activism and the activists out there? Yeah, I mean, we, we had a massive campaign against ExxonMobil. We had a massive campaign against Chrysler, a uh, massive campaign against uh, Alaska Airlines. And um, and they realized we weren't going to go away, so they dropped their sponsorship. And, and we're urging Millennium Hotels and Resorts to be next. And everyone should know. I mean, once PETA, you know, gets a hold uh, gets a hold of you, we're not going to let go until you stop abusing animals and stop, you know, sponsoring people who are abusing animals. Tell me about the local activists who are out there. How d- describe, you know, who they are? are? They just rank and file Alaskans? Are they people from around the country who just can't stand this idea of cruelty to the dogs? Who who are they, and how many are out there? Well, we had more than 40 uh, protests outside of uh, ExxonMobil stations around the country before ExxonMobil dropped their sponsorship. And, and we just had another demonstration outside of uh, Millennium Hotels and, and Resorts headquarters, uh, their North American headquarters in, in Denver, Colorado. So there's activists everywhere who, who want to protest, both inside and outside of Alaska. There are people reaching out to us. We're not even just reaching out to everyone else and saying, hey, do you want to get there to protest? They're reaching out to us and saying, hey, what can I do to help? And PETA is there to arm arm our activists with posters, literature, 
the, the knowledge and know-how to launch successful demonstrations to, to get press to these issues in their communities, whether that's in Anchorage, Alaska, or that's Den- Denver, Colorado, or New York City. Yeah, and, you know, the thing about the Iditarod, it's such a storied race. It has history. It has a kind of... Uh, there's a kind of mythology, right, uh, about, about this race. And it's ironic that uh, it was a race when it started to get medicine to the people. And it's ironic that now we're running it or now it's to be run under, under COVID. The original Iditarod, um, or well, the original trail that is used for the Iditarod was, was used as an emergency mail route to bring, um, to bring a diphtheria serum uh, to the people of Nome, but it was never used as a competitive race, and no one dog was ever forced to run that immense distance on their own. I mean, it was a relay, um, and it was it was an emergency. the The race as it exists now is simply, um, you know, a, a blood sport. It's people forcing dogs to run potentially to their deaths in the search of of fame and prize money. Now, that's an important distinction that you. You mentioned that historically it was a relay. Originally, they weren't uh, running the entire distance, but now it's a pack, right, that that is supposed to run the entire distance, and it, it, it has become an endurance race. These mushers, they're only motivated by this, by fame and a cash prize. It has nothing to do with the original intent of, of this trail. It was used before to deliver an emergency supply of deferia serum to, to Nome. I mean, that's, that's totally lost now, and, and we're running dogs to their deaths. And it has nothing to do with, with helping people or helping dogs. It just has everything to do with animal cruelty. Now, John, tell me about why you're involved with the race. I mean, you work for PETA, obviously, but, uh, you know, you this is a kind of focus for you. What is it? meant to you to be involved in working to try to end this race? I have been very proud to, to be a part of this campaign for I guess, the past uh, six years now. Um, and when we first started this campaign, we, um, I mean, well, we have been campaigning against the Iditarod for, for, you know, for probably decades now. And we've seen many, many sponsors drop. But it's about five or six years ago, uh, the movie Sled Dogs came out. It's a documentary by a director named Fern Levitt in Canada who, uh, who went to um, a dog sledding kennel in Toronto. And then, you know, she, she, like many people, went dog sledding not realizing the cruelties behind it. And then after, after she was done with her tour, she asked someone, hey, where's the, uh, you know, where are the dogs when they're not working? I want to go visit them. And they pointed her to uh, to a dog lot that was just rows and rows of dogs chained to dilapidated uh, dilapidated plastic barrels, and um, and she said that it was one of the worst things she's ever seen in her life. And and this is someone who uh, who who worked largely on you know um, political political movies and and uh, movies about genocide and and about really human atrocities. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she said that 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 experience, you know, visiting where these dogs spent their days chained up in, you know, in all weather te- temperatures without any proper socialization, without even being able to play or groom one another, just, you know, running circles on the end of a chain, it, it, it changed her entire life. I mean, she's now vegan. She's an animal rights activist. But she didn't go into creating sled dogs with that. She she went into sled dogs as someone who just, you know, went on a dog sledding tour, just like many, many people do, and then just just saw a glimpse behind the scenes that changed her entire life. So now sled dogs is actually on Amazon Prime. It's it's free on Plex.com. So uh, so I'm, I'm encouraging people to go check out sled dogs and see how PETA has taken up the, the Iditarod campaign in, in a much more magnified way in recent years. Yes. Sled dogs is basically the black fish of the dog sledding industry. When you saw it, uh, that convinced you that this was, uh, that this was not some idle thing, that uh, it had to be, be stopped. Since I've gotten involved in this, I've talked to whistleblowers who worked for these, you know, these champions. <laughs> I mean, they were champions of cruelty. I mean, they were, I, I talked to uh, Ashley Keith. She's uh, she's a former handler for Iditarod champion Mitch Seavey. 
I mean, I talk to her almost every single day now. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm talking to people who have experienced these cruel, this cruelty, um, you know, firsthand. And we have now these, uh, these investigative videos that we've taken. So we have seen this cruelty firsthand. Um, and, and it really, it keeps me going and it keeps me motivated knowing that every single year, three, so far this year, four sponsors have already dropped. I mean, the, the, the prize purse for mushers um, running the Iditarod has actually dropped from um, a total purse of $750,000 in uh, 2017 to only $400,000 mm-hmm. this year. So, I mean, that's, that's practic- practically cut in half. And that was before these four sponsors dropped. We're seeing this race coming to an end, um, you know, as, as we speak. And it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's simultaneously a, a, a sad campaign to work on, but also a motivating campaign and an exciting campaign to work on. Because I know that with the support of people around the country, we are going to end this race. The purses have dropped, so that's a demotivating factor for, for mushers. They're saying, why why do we do it if we're not going to make any money? Because if they've got to train, they're going for prize money, the prize money's lowered. And the prize money really is a function of the sponsorships that you get. What is it going to take to get them to just all go away and realize that maybe they've got to change the race or end the race as it exists now, but maybe change the race and maybe make it with snowmobiles or make it with, I mean, is there ever a a time when they might do something like that, make it totally one that's cruelty free, no dogs, no cruelty? Absolutely. The iron dog race is already a race with, with snowmobiles that follows the same route. The Iditarod trail invitational is a race of human endeavor, um, where where people run or ski the trail. I mean, there there's there's zero athleticism in forcing dogs to pull a sled until they collapse from exhaustion or die by, in, by after inhaling their own vomit. I mean, if these mushers want to prove that they're an endurance athlete, they should run the thousand miles themselves and leave the dogs out of it. I mean, we could just look at at other other places. Um, like like whaling towns in New England, who no longer harpoon and kill majestic whales, but they still make a fortune from souvenirs and historic tours. And and residents um, in, of of Manopino, Spain, uh, they now run from giant polystyrene balls instead of the once traditional bull. The Iditarod, they could remove dogs from the race and they could honor Alaska's history without harming and killing any dogs. Yeah. And so what is the chance, and the race is coming up this weekend. What is the chance of maybe suddenly someone getting some, some sense of morals and ethics and saying, Hey, let's stop this nonsense and let's end the race now uh, during COVID. Let, you know, we don't need it. What are the chances of that happening? Probably slim to none, right? Or but it should happen. It could happen, right? We're continuing to urge the Iditarod Trail Committee to cancel the race now for the safety of of dogs and Alaskans alike, given this whole given the novel coronavirus. The the real pressure is on the on the sponsors. And who are the next big sponsors that you're targeting that have to that have to come to their senses that this race is not a, a good idea for anyone. Millennium Hotels and Resorts is their top, a top target right now. Well, but there's all their principal sponsors, such as uh, GCI and Donlin Gold. And they're all the same level of sponsorship as ExxonMobil. So these are the companies that are really propping up this death race. And we're urging them to drop their sponsorships immediately. If it goes on, uh, as it looks like it probably will this time around, once again... How many dogs could die from if they actually run this weekend? I mean, there there was almost two dozen dogs who died in the first sight of Um Since then, it has you know the the numbers have varied from year to year, but every single year, hundreds of dogs are pulled off the race due to exhaustion, illness, or injury. Well, we don't need to wait to see how many dogs die in this death race this year. I mean, the idea it's not too late to cancel the race, and it is not too late for these sponsors to disassociate themselves with a race that is, um, you know, is killing dogs. You know, let's talk about the dogs just for a second. What kind of dogs are these? I mean, they're what breed specifically? Is there one breed that is better than others? Are they, 
of mixed breed? Is are they purebred? Talk about the dogs for a second. These dogs are just like dogs that that are in your home. You know, they they are all varieties of breeds and mutts um, that are no different than the uh, than the dogs that are sitting uh, sitting on your couch or sleeping in your bed. I mean, the, there's no breed called a sled dog. There is no such thing as a sled dog. These are just regular dogs that are being forced to run to their deaths that are never knowing uh, human kindness or, or the warmth of a house. I mean, these, these are dogs that are being totally exploited for, for a cash prize and, and sometimes die as a result. But there's no one specific breed that has been you know, that has come up again and again, like a Husky or a Saluki or anything like that, that, that you could say, oh, they, yeah, that dog, that's a sled dog. They could be much. They could be, they don't have to be a purebred dog. They're, they're the same dogs that are sitting on our couch or in our beds. They're, they're not pure. They're not necessarily purebreds. And, uh, you know, they're not necessarily Huskies. They're, I know that's the, that's the image that comes to people's mind. But but they're not. I mean, people listening to this, look at the dog sitting right next to you. That the dog being forced to run to his death for the Iditarod likely is not that that different, if any, from the one sitting next to you. What time does the race start, and how long does it usually take? It takes several days, right? Yeah, it, it varies. Um, it varies depending on on trail conditions, and I mean, they run through brutal storms. It doesn't really matter, you know, how icy it is or brutal the terrain is. You know, those mushers are forcing their dogs to to run at a rapid pace. So it really varies depending on trail conditions every year. But it usually, you know, they're forced to run about a thousand miles in under two weeks. Wow. So if it starts this Saturday, it could go on until, let's see, another 14 days, right? From Yep. Yeah, so, it could. Uh, but a lot of the, the, the top mushers, you know, the, the championship mushers, mm-hmm. they'll force these dogs to run in just over a week. I oh. mean, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's very, it's extremely, extremely rough for these dogs, and they're not trying to give the dogs a rest. I mean, they're actually only manda- uh, mandated to give them 40 hours of rest throughout this whole race. So the winners, the quote unquote winners of the champion mushers, they're pushing them. And if they finish it sooner than 14 days, those are the champions. Those are the ones that we got to watch out for if they don't die of exhaustion, but the others are allowed to finish out uh, within two weeks. Yeah, they, they they can run until they, they finish. They even have a prize for the person who, who does it last, you know, a token prize called the Red Lantern. Um, you know, and, and often the people running the Red Lantern are, 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 are you know, are amateurs, people who, whose dogs are not equipped. I mean, really, no dogs are equipped for this. Whether they're a champion musher or whether, you know, they're, they're you know, the last musher on the trail, their dogs are suffering. And whether it's, you know, these animals are forced to run, you know, run in 10 days or whether they're forced to run in two weeks. I mean, 1,000 miles is 1,000 miles. And these, are, these, these dogs, are, they're not slow, snowmobiles. They're not pieces of sporting equipment. They're individuals yeah, but you who know, suffer. You know, what gets me, though, John, is that there are actually some amateurs out there who think that their dogs could run this race and they do it because of... Well, for whatever reason, to prove themselves, uh, you know, as rugged individuals, I don't know. But there are people like that, right? Amateurs who run the race? Uh, to qualify for the Iditarod, you do need to do other long-distance races prior. But um, but it really doesn't matter how much experience you have. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't matter how long these dogs have been training. You know, they're, they're, they're only dogs. They're not snowmobiles. You, you know, you can't you can't take your your dog to the mechanic and soup him up. I mean, uh, but you, you can you can unfortunately give him drugs. I mean, there was a a uh, there was one musher that was actually um, caught and and suspended for doping a few years ago. So I mean, the the no matter whether uh, no matter how much experience you have, no matter or whether it's a lot of experience or or, or little experience. I mean, the dogs are the dogs are suffering, so it doesn't matter whether you're first or last. I mean, you shouldn't be in that race at all. And activists are going to be out if if the race goes on. If the race isn't stopped, activists will be along the race route throughout 
Uh, the Ipita will be, we will be at the, uh, at the start of the race and it will be also protesting, um, outside, uh, Millennium Hotels and Resorts, urging them to drop their sponsorship of the race. And where's the, uh, the hotel, the hotels in Nome? Where's the hotel? In Anchorage. The, okay. So you'll be in Anchorage and where's, and the start is at Willow, is it? Yes. The start is in Willow. And that is how far from Anchorage? About 45 minutes. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, people concerned. We we are urging people to to get out there and and join us at both. Come in and urge urge Millennium Hotels and Resorts at their Lakefront Anchorage location to drop their sponsorship of the Iditarod and then come out to us at the start of the race and uh, and protest alongside of us alongside of us and tell the Iditarod to stop running dogs to their death, stop treating them like like snowmobiles, and and replace them with, with an, a new event that n- no longer uh, celebrates the suffering of dogs, but instead can celebrate, you know, dogs in Alaskan heritage in all its, its glory without running them to their death. John D. Leonardo, thank you very much for joining us on the PETA podcast. Thank you very much, Mo. I really appreciate your time today. I'm very glad to be on. Zoologist John D. Leonardo, PETA Senior Manager of Animals and Entertainment and National Grassroots Campaigner specializing in the Iditarod. Go to PETA.org and you can watch the daily feed from the Iditarod protest and you can go there to take action and see if you can stop the Iditarod 2021, the COVID era Iditarod. That's at PETA.org. That's our show this time out. Don't forget to send the link for the show to your friends. Thank you for listening. Contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or on AMOK.com. Or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's at ALDEF, A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo. Thank you.